Right. Well, welcome everyone to uh, today's BIPS webinar, which is the final one for 2023, uh, uncovering Dr. Hansi Wolf's collection, a life contribution to the study of Iran and Iranian studies with Dr. Pedram Khosrow Najad. Let me introduce Dr. Khosrow Najad. He is an adjunct professor at the School of Social Sciences at Western Sydney University, and he is the founding moderator of Anthropology of Middle East and Central Asia, the ACME network of the European Association of Social Anthropologists. He's recognized for his contribution in the fields of visual piety and material religion, war, memory, and forced displacement, gender, sexuality, race, and including slavery in modern Iran and Persian aid societies, the greater Middle East, the Central Asia, the Muslim world, and Australia. He explores the manners in which culture, memory, and visual culture are bound up in, in as well as influenced and altered by wider socio-political and cultural trends. Uh, he's been working since August 2019 on this very interesting project, interdisciplinary project about German civilian expatriates of Iran who had been detained by the by British forces in Iran in 1941 after the country's invasion in the Second World War and then brought to Australian internment prison camps and stayed on in Australia after the end of the war. He has also recently been appointed curator of exhibitions and collection at the Grafton Regional Gallery in Australia. And without further ado and taking up any more of his time, I'm going to let Pestro, uh, Dr. Khosrow uh, Najad uh, get on with it. Again, all questions to be directed there uh, via the Q&A function on Zoom. And Pedram, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, saying hello to you from the future. I should say good morning, by the way, uh, because it's, it's yes. four o'clock in the morning uh, where Pedram is, and I'm sure that he has uh, plenty of water and or coffee. So thank you very much for, for doing this at four in the morning. So uh, well done, you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Andrew. As I said, I'm saying hello from the future. It's uh, 4 a.m. I'm talking to you um, from north of New South Wales, Australia. And as it is tradition here, I would like to begin with acknowledgement to country. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting today on the lands, the skies, and the waters of the Banjalum, Gumbanjir and Yegel peoples, where I'm presenting from today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and recognize their continuous connection to country, country was, stay, and will be uh, belong to the First Nation people. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, say thank you, uh, first of all, to uh, Dr. Vista Sarkhush Curtis, uh, Vice President of BIPS, Professor Andrew Newman, Outreach Director of BIPS, and especially uh, Ms. Sylvia Ferreri, Outreach and Digitization Coordinator of Project. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be here with you and your members and audiences for last session of BIPS Talks. Also, I would like to uh, forward my gratitude and thanks to Wolf family especially John and Roswitha and Heldegard Wolf, children of uh, Dr. Hans Wolf, also uh, members of my project, our project, which is their project. Today they are here, even it's early uh, morning in Australia, for helping me to develop the project together. And also I would like to thank uh, Western City University School of Social Sciences that uh, actually the project and the entire collection is sitting there at the moment temporary until we find a good house for it. And in the end also I would like to thank my colleague Dr. Mahru Musavi who helped the project with me to run some part of that together. So today presentation, uh, I try to be a storyteller, if I uh, can be a good one. And this story will have two major parts. First is the life um, brief uh, life story of um, Dr. Hans Wolf, which we can divide it in three major parts. The first part is between 1936 and 1941, uh, which is during the Big Depression period until the outbreak of Second World War, his mission in Iran. Then 1941 to 1947, when he's a prisoner in Australian Second World War internment prison camp complexes. And then uh, last part, 1963 to 1967, that he began to work again on Iran and Pakistan and end of his life. Second part of a pro uh, presentation, 
we are trying to develop a little bit for you the situation of collection and material. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, with you to go directly to the presentation. Um, and I hope you can see everything. Uh, feel free uh, to uh, make a screenshot of whatever you like. This presentation first and foremost is to invite you for a brainstorming to help me uh, about the collection. It's a very complex project and um, we are doing that with empty hand and with love for the collection and material. And um, we will see why I wanted to do the first uh, academic public presentation through BIPS, because BIPS is involved and was involved in the Dr. Wolf project. So um, Hans Wolf was born on 27th August 1907 in Lüdinghausen in Germany. And after finishing high school in Cologne, he studied and trained in Lübeck in mechanical engineering and vocational pedagogy, completing his studies just as the big depression period was in Europe in 20s and he could not uh, find like others easily jobs. He had some jobs in between, but he stays in Germany and continued uh, small works until in 1936, his uncle who had a good job in a foreign office in Berlin help Hans to get a position to plan and set up uh, technical engineering schools in Iran. So we should not mix that one with Tehran engineer, a German Iran school that created in Qajar period, since Qajar period, which is still is in Tehran and continue. This is another uh, scheme and it's like German foreign minister help to the Iranian government by the request of Reza Shah, the king of Iran at that period, to uh, run a local engineering technology schools. So Hans Wolf uh, goes to Iran in 1936 and build up, um, let me see if my slides are good. Yes, uh, 1936 goes to Iran with his family and settled down in Shiraz. I should add here one big parent is that big depression period, Iran became a good market for uh, young, talented German engineers, all sorts of engineers, builders, architects, dealers, craft people. And we estimate between five to 10,000 civilian Germans were living in Iran between two wars during big depression period and their family were there and their children were born in Iran, uh, including Hans Eberhard Wolf. So he arrives in Iran in 1936 and built up the first uh, engineering school in Shiraz where uh, his first daughter Hildegard is born. And then he goes to Isfahan to build up the second uh, uh, school and then the third one in Tabriz. Uh, where um, we have the outbreak of Second World War. He comes to Tehran uh, and will be detained with the rest of Germans of Iran. The images that you see is Hans in the middle uh, and uh, with his students in Shiraz uh, Engineering School, which is still there. All three um, schools are still there and continue their work. I could trace uh, where they are at the moment and who are responsible. Um, you can see here on the top left, the visit of Minister of uh, Industry of Iran to the Shiraz school and how they are packing for going to Isfahan and uh, make the second engineering school. Um, during the opening of um, Shiraz school, um, Reza Shah will go there and congratulate Hans Wolf in person and ask him two things. A uh, narration says, as you can see in the introduction of his book, The Traditional Crafts of Persia, that Reza Shah tell Hans, you should be very proud that today uh, the objects, Western technical objects that we purchased from Germany, now Iranian students are making them. But I want to bring to your attention, Hans Wolf, that Iran has 7,000 years of tradition of craft, science, technology, and art. And I would like my students, new talented Iranian learned their own technology and craft too. 
not only Western. Therefore, I give you a royal uh, project. While you are in Iran, you travel all around the country, collect the information and technical material and knowledge, most importantly, of traditional craft, art, technology, and science, and add them to the curriculum of these schools, modernize them. But in the same time, you collect this information and details to write the first ever Persian encyclopedia of traditional art, craft, science, and technology. And this is how between 1936 until 1941, while working in his teaching schools, Hans Wolf with this royal order traveled all around the country and collected majority, I can say, the traditional art, craft, and technology of Iran. Uh, probably, as we can see, this is his wife, Magdalena, was her first assistant and supporter with love. They worked all around the country. And um, Hans uh, had two Leica cameras. I think he was like a lovely ethnographer, archaeologist all around the country. There are a huge number of material that I come to there, but just wanted to show you some of his field work. Uh, photographs working with the local people all around the country. So he was a very humble person, very professional. Um, here, um, one of the important points about his field work in this part, 1936 to 1941, is that Hans collected all of the vernacular terms and terminologies of all sorts of crafts and guilds and wrote them in Farsi and local dialects. If he was in, like here, Shah Salan, Azerbaijan, in Azerbaijani dialect, if he was in Bakhtiari, Luri Bakhtiari, if he was in Gilan, Gilaki. And it's very important because um, he created, when he published his book, uh, an appendix, which is still unique in the world. And all of those who did review his book mentioned first this appendix in the end, which is terminology of vernacular crafts and production of material, which is unique. And I can uh, say plus 90% of those crafts and material are disappeared uh, from today's crafts of Persia. So this aspect of his work is very important. Uh, it's not topic of today to talk about the internment of civilian Germans of Persia. But anyway, Churchill was not happy that these five to 10,000 civilian Germans are living in Iran. With the invasion of Iran, a North from Soviet army and South from per, uh, uh, British army, um, they were trapped anyway, and they were detained in Tehran, Shemiran, a summer um, quarter of German embassy because they were refugees there for seven weeks um, by the order of British army with the help of Iranian police, they separate by force their wife and children, deport them, very bad story, to the Germany and Austria and Denmark to Turkey. And 488 single men uh, were detained on Iranian territory, exceptionally with two families, 14 people. So in total, 512 of civilian Germans of Iran deported to Australia. They arrived here on Port Adelaide on November 1941. Uh, families go to Tatura, the camp in Victoria uh, of Australia. Uh, Helga Griffin is today with us. Thank you, Helga John. She's the only survivor female detainee of Germans of uh, Iran. Uh, Helga is an uh, active member of our project and a help in both project too. And Hans Wolf along other 488 go to single camps, intermittent prison camps in South Australia in Day that you can see the photo here. I would like to open the parenthesis very fast here that these 488 people, not all of them, but majority of them, they were not simple internees. They were top rate intellectuals and professional academics that Reza Shah invited to Iran to create the Department of Archaeology of the University of Tehran. Professor Wilhelm Eilers was one of them. Uh, Professor uh, Koch was one of them to create the Department of Ge uh, Geology of the University of Tehran. Call uh, Zubek, great musician and violinist for the Department of Music, etc. So these internees inside the camp, we are in second part of Hans Wolf's life for Iran and Iranian studies. They did amazing things in the camp that you cannot believe it, and no one in Iranian studies knows about that. First of all, they create a college inside the camp to teach other internees 
and they got from Red Cross the certificate as an official college. That is not our topic. But they create also for themselves a group, these elites. And we come to that and change the lifestyle of the camp and use the knowledge of Iran, Iranian studies, Iranian craft, Iranian science and art as healing system for trauma of barbed wire disease or trauma of the imprisonment in the camps. Just give you one image here. They created uh, two <laughs> coffee uh, houses inside the camp. As you can see, like Kashan uh, architecture style and use the Iranian traditional Kashani sand brick style to create these uh, camp in Love Day and one in Tatura. Anyway, as you can see here, these 10 elites, uh, they had their weekly meetings where they seriously work on their level of Persian literature, archeology, span history, and exchange of knowledge between themselves, create a school of Iranian studies in Second World War internment prison camp, reading and writing Hafez, Sadi, Omar Khayyam, Ferdowsi, Attar, philosophy, and every Saturday, one of them give a professional talk, as you can see here, Hans gave a talk about the traditional craft of Persia, serious talk, they have music, many things. So these documents that you can see here are from Hans Fu's personal diaries of the camp. Uh, you can see left side, uh, he's uh, working on Saadi, but it's not simple. I should tell you each of them when you work, they were free to choose which part of poetry and Persian literature they wanted to work on it. Here you can see he selected things that shows his love for Iran and how he's missing his wife and Hildegard, first daughter born in Shiraz. And her name is Shirin, you know, or uh, another, uh, Rosvita, another name. So, and as you can see here, Hans was in this image very, very clever. Uh, you can see uh, there are about Shiraz, uh, Shiraz of Vaslebi Misalash, Khodavandan Gahdar Azivalash. He's very, very, very uh, attached to Persian Shia talismanic protection verses, as you can see here, and uh, Ayat al Kursi, which all of us we know why uh, could be used in such a situations. Uh, he he was involved in craft with many of them, created this box that you can see for his daughter, Rosvita, who left uh, him. She was one, one month baby when they were separated in Iran and did not see father for eight years. The box would ease tea boxes or any, you know, used boxes that they could find in the camp. Uh, I should uh, add that Hans coming from jewelry family, and he was professional jewelers, and this is art of the camp that he made among many in the camp. This is another that he made for uh, Hildegard, uh, the patch tan, as you can see, and all is designed and done by hand by Hans Wolf in the camp. Anyway, uh, all of the Germans of Persia is staying in the camp until 1947. By the order of Churchill, they could not back to Iran. Only a few of them they could, and... In 1949, this is the first time that mother and three children back from Germany to Australia joined father. Between 1947 and 49, uh, Hans had different works, nothing to do with our topic today. And when family arrives, he buy a piece of land in a uh, suburb of Sydney and create a house. A house that he called that Gorg Abad. Uh, wolf's village because his family was wolf but he loved the Nelgorgabad and as you can see from the A to Z of this house he used the knowledge that he gained in Iran regarding building bricks uh, it's amazing I cannot go to details but wanted to let you know how he used uh, all of the images that you can see and knowledge from uh, Iran and make the house especially uh, I'm fascinated by this chimene or whatsoever we can call it fireplace because he did extensively work on the system of Shumina in Iran and apply that there. 
In right side image, you can see John and Rosvita and the ceramic on the wall that you can see Hans designed by himself. Bismillah Rahman Rahim made it in gold during his second trip uh, in Iran after a period. Anyway, as you can see here, just wanted to let you know here, you can see the label Gurgabad, the house. And uh, many famous people lived with them. And as you can see, maybe you see the lady, Maria Von Trapp, the famous Sound of Music. This is the real one, uh, Maria, who lived a few weeks with them, uh, with uh, Wolf family. And I think it was interesting just to mention how they loved Iran. But the house also was many, many material culture from Iran. Uh, this luster or lamp made by Hans himself and is exactly based on, uh, uh, it's very famous, you can see Darish, uh, the great uh, um, epigraphy from Persepolis in their house. So I don't want to go beyond that because just wanted to mention how they loved Iran and how he applied um, Iranian art and craft in his personal life too. So after the camp, uh, we have two periods of his activity. Uh, immediately in the uh, 1950s, uh, he uh, became a member of the Department of Engineering um, Technology Department at the University of New South Wales. And with connections that he finds, um, he contacts everyone, everyone. And he enrolled also in master program and then PhD program there. And um, UNESCO find him. He make a very, very important contract with the Smithsonian and run a project uh, to continue his work that Reza Shah gave him uh, before the uh, internment period um, to continue that. But nothing happened until 1953 because he was very clever before being interred in Iran. He put all of the collection of Reza Shah project in the safe of German bank in Tabriz. The dark was his friend. And he could retrieve the entire collection intact, except two cameras in 1953 in Australia. So 1953 is when he can begin again and work on his project, enrolled in Department of um, Engineering Department and Technology in SW, become assistant in the lab of this department, contact with the Smithsonian and run the project. The Smithsonian asked him, continue your project. We'd like you to continue that. But in the Smithsonian Department of Anthropology and Archaeology, we want to create a contemporary museum of technology of Middle East. And your work in Iran is very important for us. So communication that you can see in this um, part of uh, slides is related at his communication that with the Smithsonian and Iranian embassy in US. And it's huge. He kept everything. So I come to that. So. Um, he will go to Iran for this project uh, in two seasons um, and uh, collect around 2,500 objects only for Smithsonian. They are sitting in the basement of the Smithsonian somewhere and they don't care anymore what Hans did there. No one work on that. There is no details. I'm happy to answer your question about this. Um, he, he had two seasons of work in Iran in one in 1964 and one in 1965, and then two seasons in Pakistan, 1966 and 1967. During his mission in Iran, uh, he uh, lived in Bips at Golhak, and also he delivered talks for Bips. Uh, I could not go beyond because I have no time to go along to all documents, but I'm happy here to share with you the letter that he and his daughter prepared when they wanted to leave Iran and say thank you. And I just, you, you can see the British instead of Persian is one of them, but there are a lot of communications uh, while he was in Bibs and work there. Um, in 1963, uh, uh, he finished his PhD and um, contact left and right, and then MIT accept to publish his book. In 1965, he goes eight weeks to MIT, uh, publishing house in U.S. to prepare his book, and book will be published in 1966. He sent the book to everyone, and as you can see, he was in touch with many, many after war specialists of Iran. This is here a letter of uh, Professor Arthur Apan Pope, who at that time was in University of Pahlavi, American University of Iran, 
he, when he returned to Iran, a dedicate a uh, copy of his book to King of Iran, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, the son of Reza Shah, in respect of the project run uh, initially by his father, Reza Shah. We have this amazing record in the collection. Uh, his book was, you know, had reviewed more than 30 times, uh, including by Anne Lampton. Uh, and unfortunately, Hans could not read them because he passed away in 1967, but, you know, more than 30 reviews. And also he was in touch with all researchers, um, mostly uh, historian of Islamic art, archaeology, historians of the Middle East regarding technology. Here you can see left side is communication, one of the communities that he had with Charles Ringelson. Uh, and it's amazing in the collection, we have all of this communication. And uh, he published, he published and interviewed many, many things. One of the important articles is the connection between the glazing techniques that he uh, found with his daughter during his uh, project in Iran while living in Bibs, about the connection between um, these um, turquoise glazing technique between Egypt and Iran. Anyway, so he published more than 30 articles in mostly American in English speakers, but there are more than unfinished because he could not finish them and now they are in collection here. You have some of them. Uh, unfortunately, Hans passed away uh, in during his second season work of the Smithsonian in Pakistan and was buried there in 31st uh, December 1967. So we are in December too, I think it's cool, nice, um, you know, Connection, um, uh, family wanted the body to stay there where he did work. So um, second part of pr uh, presentation here begins regarding the detail of collection is extensive. In collection, we have around 5,000 photographs, intact, untouched, more than 15 diaries uh, regarding the 1936-1940 one in Iran. And around five during two seasons of work in Bib Spy for a Smithsonian. Uh, each craft has different folder. Here, for example, is one of the 10 folders of weaving. We are in Yazd and amazing traditional looms that uh, Zadi Bafi loom, Mahmal Bafi loom, velvet, they are disappeared all. And um, all photographs, you know, they were stamped, dated, uh, and uh, they have these details. I just uh, kept one of them, another folder on agriculture. All of the notes, as I told you, is they are intact, kept very, very amazingly by him. But there are tons of uh, photo uh, note cards regarding the field. Each of them has, as you can see here, codes related to the folder. But it's a huge project. So there are 5,000. I think photographs and negatives, there are 5,000 such a fish that you can see here and the details and many, many others that are still intact since uh, 90, 1960s are in boxes. There are a bunch of decades and films that are even there to open them because you know they are delicate. Here we need to talk about collection management, <laughs> which is very, very important. I should thank again here, you see Dr. Mahru Musavi, who, uh, because we are both in uh, Sydney, uh, helped uh, a lot to develop some part of project. Recently in a European conference of Uranus in Leiden, we had a special panel chair together with another colleague, Dr. Zen Hari from Germany. And we had amazing seven speakers specifically about wolf uh, collection importance. And there are objects in the collection that legally came out of Iran um, uh, collected during the first season, not the Smithsonian season, as you can see, and they're in the collection. Um, you can see them here. So in 90, uh, sorry, in 2020, Wolf siblings and family went to the solicitors and they deliver everything to the collection and I'm temporary uh, keeper of the entire collection until fine a safe place for the entire collection and material culture. I can confirm with all of my effort, none of the Australian museums or institutions and universities are interested. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of the reasons that I opened the call today for all colleagues uh, who can, who have some idea and want to share and help in this regard, um, because uh, I'm just a keeper, temporary keeper, not the owner. And 
so Hans Wolf was a fighter. Hans Wolf died in 1967, age of 60. If only he had 10 more years uh, to continue, he did his PhD in a very old age, you know, and a uh, hard worker, lover of Iran, you know, and uh, a loved person, amazed by Iran, Iranian culture. He stays and belongs to traditional school of Oriental uh, studies, definitely of German school, I can say. And um, today um, we we did write also to um, MIT Press. We returned the right of the book for republication of book to the collection again. So, uh, so this is uh, where I think I stop and just want to say that the collection is amazing, uh, intact since Hans Wolf prepared that. It's not huge. We can talk about around, uh, I think here I can stop sharing. Uh, yes, uh, we have around uh, probably uh, 30 to 35 boxes, separate from objects, the material and documentation, all communication that he had with different researchers, a family uh, communications when he was in a camp, all of the handwriting diaries and typed ones, reports of a uh, first period of work for Reza Shah project, and also a Smithsonian in Iran, a Smithsonian in Pakistan, uh, and uh, it's ready to go. But you know, I'm the only one here, and I should say that Hans Wolf is only one of the internees that in our project we are working on. Uh, since 2019, I stay in Australia only for this project. Uh, we found uh, one by one, I found children of civilian Germans of Iran. Now we have a group, we uh, work together in a reciprocal project, a step by step, we find out what we have in the collections. Um, another amazing collection is uh, Gershik family, belong to Helga's family. Her father was a uh, chief engineer of uh, Kamsaks in Iran. And uh, for instance, just to let you know, the um, uh, uh, Tunnel Kandovan, Kandovan Tunnel or um, Veresk Bridge, Pole Veresk, done by Helga's father, with amazing photography and again, objects from Iran. So um, we do our best. But I have two minutes to uh, wrap up everything. Uh, why I bring it to you today? this very fast, uh, brief uh, visual historiography of Wolf and Wolf collection is to have understanding the person who loved Iran, loved Iran and Persian craft and technology and science. Even maybe his look that period was a little bit good for his period, today is old fashioned, we know that, Orientalist, we know that. But the material per se is intact. All of the material that he collected, especially visually and notes and uh, terminologies are intact and can help different students, researchers, and there are huge different type of publication that we can extract from uh, the collection. I think we can digitize them, put them online for free for everyone, but it's not mine. It's something that needs a support, uh, big support, collective support, and work together to bring it to the attention of everyone, especially I think students of Iran and the studies are eager. And the conference in Leiden uh, a few months ago showed us that there is huge interest. So thank you so much. Uh, don't hesitate uh, to run your question through Andrew. Uh, you can email me wherever you have any question or if you need any document and material from the collection, I'm happy to share that with you. Thank you so much and you, Andrew, back to you. Thank you very much, Pedro. That was absolutely fascinating. I had a, a, a couple of questions here, both historically, but also in terms of the crafts uh, themselves. Were there, so historically in this period when he was rounded up and then sent away, what, what was, his, his family was still back in Iran? Uh, no. Uh, the question is that um, real story is, we should ask why Iran was invaded. Iran was invaded because what is happening exactly today in Ukraine happened in Iran. Iran was neutral. Reza Shah was clever because of First World War. He never wanted to enter into the war. But 
Churchill was very, very anxious about the oil pipes in the south of Iran, and also the biggest colonial uh, of empire in India. He knew if Hitler attacked Poland, the second target is Russia and then Iran. So therefore, they needed to stop Germans on the border of Russia. How we can do that? With the US, we transfer arm and armors through Iranian National Railroad to Russia to fight on the borders to stop they don't come to Iran. Reza Shah didn't accept that. Therefore, they created fake information that civilian Germans of Iran are fifth elements and they're all of them are Nazi. And this is entirely fake, entirely fake. However, we should, I should admit that we should keep civilian Germans of Iran from real official officers of Germany in Iran. Two different topics, two different stories. So civilian Germans of Iran, they were understood the topic very late. The ambassador asked them, leave Iran months ago before the invasion, but very close to the invasion, he understood many of them still are in Iran, told them, all of you from Iran come to become refugee in the Shem Iran in the summer quarter of German embassy in Bolhak. Because it was in frontier and neighbor to the Turkey embassy, and he promised them, I can help you to Turkey, you back to your country. But he didn't know that he will trap all of them. They came there, they stayed for around seven to nine weeks with all families, thousands of people in uh, German, uh, you know, Shemiran um, summer quarter of German embassy. But with the invasion of Iran, immediately the garden was surrounded by Soviet and British army with the help of Iranian police. On the territory of Iran, on the land of German, you know, embassy, summer quarter, by force they separated mother and children from husbands. Send the men through the railroad to Bandar Shahpur, and then they send them to deserts of Basra, which is temporary interrogation camp. They interrogate them, single men and those two, uh, 14, two families, on the deserts of Basra for seven weeks. Mother and children stay in embassy and they send them with thousands of convoy in three different times, like prisoners escorted by Russian army through Tehran to uh, Bazargan frontiers to send them to Turkey. But horrible history and what they did to this mother and innocent children in Iranian territory, by the help of Iranian police, but done by Russian army is catastrophic, Andrew. Mm. So mothers deported by force from Iran to Turkey, then they went to Denmark, Germany, Austria, stayed there until the war, under the bombing, all these years, and they joined fathers in 1949. So they were back. They, in, so, so the Wolf family was back then in Germany. They were one of the ones Germany. who went back to Germany. Okay, right. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. Mother then, with three babies. Right. And then during the time that, that, that he had the all, all the craft material, this was the material which you were referring to, which was in, in Tabriz, that he kept in Tabriz. So when, yes, he, when he came back to Iran, wh wh what was his immediate reaction with that material in Tabriz? Did he go back and Get it. No, 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 no. He didn't go to Iran. He he came out of the camp in 1947 and worked for two, three years to get money to bring wife back here. Right. He received here in 1953 his collection from Iran directly before going to Iran. So right. they send it. It's a very beautiful story. Right. Then he could again recreate his research go to university at Smithsonian and, you know, convince everyone because they, they had no right to back to Iran. There were only five to 10 they could back to Iran and continue their work. So the material for the book was based on the material he had gathered before the war as well. Exactly. As the correct. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. And, and all that then is, yeah. is there with you. Master degree, PhD, book, all done by Reza Shah project prior 
to the invasion of Iran. Okay, and 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 it resides with you now. Yes, yeah, in the Western City it. University. Okay, right. Okay, well, that's that's fascinating. Also, it's, so it's temporary. It, it's temporary. You know, keeping. I'm grateful to Western City because no budget, no grant, because I had no time to do these things, and I'm alone. Most importantly. Right. Many, many thanks for uh, staying up or getting up at this hour to give us this most interesting and enlightening talk. And with that, I wish everybody uh, a good uh, break. Hope everybody gets some sort of break. And we will see everybody again in January of 2024. Thank you and good evening from uh, Edinburgh up here or down south in London. And good morning uh, from Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you again for everyone. I appreciate and uh, I hope you enjoy the end of year and the festivities. Thank you now. Good night. Good morning. Thank you. Bye-bye.